I am an Olympian, a silver medal cyclist from the London 2012 Summer Games. I competed at the highest level of my sport for 12 years with a voracious appetite for winning. Prior to my cycling career, I was a fashion model who walked the runways of New York all the time hiding a cocaine dependency and the darkness of a life-threatening eating disorder. Truthfully, I was no better than a junkie, mistreating my body to the point of near physical and psychological ruin. And after not one, but two suicide attempts, I had reached a fork in the road. I knew that I was either gonna die of anorexia or I was gonna have to choose to live. I didn't know if I would pull off the living part, but something deep inside me told me that I had to try. And so I did. Three years of intensive therapy ensued. Most days I wanted to quit, but I didn't. And towards the very end of that three-year healing journey, my therapist recommended to me that I try an activity or a sport of some kind so I could learn to move my body in a healthy way again, which I hadn't been able to do for so many years. I really quite randomly chose cycling. <laughs> Just sounded fun at the time. Freedom, wind in my face, being outside. Well, I just never looked back. And in 2012, I stood on the Olympic podium, a junkie's life all but a dust cloud in my rearview mirror. And when I stood on that Olympic podium, I had trained a lot. Six hours a day, six days a week for, gosh, many, many, many years. I had circled endless, endless laps in high-banked velodromes climbed up mountains, down twisting descents faster than cars. I did all of this so that I could try and produce almost 1,000 watts of power off the start line at Olympic Games. Now that's enough to power five 47-inch flat screen TVs. And that's me on the start line looking a little tiny bit nervous, more nervous than I am right now. <laughs> yeah. I did all of this, all of this training and so much more for what I call Olympic level compassion. That is, I did it, eating no meat whatsoever. Zero. None. Now, why in the world no meat? Most of you are like, what are you, where, where is this going? Why would you do that to yourself? What does that even mean, right? Well, let me just tell you my journey of how I got there and how I coined this term, Olympic level compassion. One really late night, we were, oh gosh, we were on the East Coast racing. And I was up in the middle of the night, exhausted from the race, yet I couldn't sleep. We've all been there. And I'm just kind of mindlessly flicking through the channels, and I land on this expose that depicts the hidden camera footage of the horrific cruelty that goes on behind closed doors at slaughterhouses. The images and the video was showing cows and pigs that were being beaten, blinded, some burned, kicked, cut, and some of them with sharp objects shoved up their anuses to get them to move to slaughter. I was horrified. I was terrified, too. And at the same time, it was like I was humbled and ashamed because as a meat eater, I was a party to this. Well, that night, I said, I don't, I don't care how hard it is or what it takes, I'm never going to eat meat again because I can't stand that animals have to go through this just to make it to my dinner plate. So now, that same exact hunger that I had had that drove me to excel in cycling, that same hunger that drove me to excel in my recovery from anorexia, was now driving me to completely rethink the way we behave when it comes to our food. Research shows us that 95% of the cruelty to animals occurs at the hands of the meat and dairy industry. These industries confine, mutilate, and slaughter 60 billion land animals every year, 60 billion. Now, that's eight times as many animals go through slaughterhouse lines as there are people on the planet. And each and every one of these animals that grinds through this factory farm system greatly harms the environment. <laughs> factory farming is a much larger producer of global carbon emissions than all of technology combined, all of it, cars, trucks, and coal. Right now in California, we're in a historic drought, right? We're all trying to save water here and there in between uh, scrub-a-dub-dubs in the shower or however you're doing it. Well, 
It takes 16 gallons of water to grow eight ounces of soy milk. That is the water that it takes to water those soybeans to grow that. Sounds like kind of a lot, 16 gallons of water for just like eight little measly ounces of soy milk. But it takes 850 gallons of water to grow eight ounces of beef. That burger you had yesterday is equivalent to 30 average American showers. A plant-based person consumes 200,000 gallons of water less than a person who eats the average American diet. But just as important to me as this environmental impact is the emotional toll. Because each and every one of these animals is capable of feeling anxiety, pain, fear, comfort, and joy. The same exact feelings as the dogs and cats are who are in our homes. So home, right? All right. We're just going to talk for a minute about the animals that are in our home. Consider for a moment the Thanksgiving dinner table. It is common practice to serve a butterball turkey at Thanksgiving because butterball is indeed the largest producer of turkey meat in the United States. And I would confess that that roasted bird with all its trimmings and fixins, as we say in the South, looks appetizing. It does. But looks can be wildly deceiving because here's the ugly truth. In 2011, workers at Butterball were convicted on felony charges of cruelty to factory farm birds. These workers routinely kicked, stomped, and dragged these birds by their wings and by their necks. They beat the birds with metal bars, seemingly for sport, as they caught on tape. And as for the baby chicks who don't get to make it to slaughter, they throw them in a trough, and then they grind them up while they're still alive in macerating machines. I know, it sounds so cruel. There has to be another way, because 96% of us say that we're against cruelty to animals, right? 96% of you are against what we just saw, yet we still torture and mutilate 60 billion of them every year. Do these numbers make sense to you? This doesn't have to be about, I don't know, hippies and tree-hugging, tofu-eating, because honestly, I'm the kind of the furthest thing away from a, a hippie. But this is honestly just about the heart and soul of Mother Earth and the heart and soul of these animals. They are in our care. So what does it take for us to care enough to just take action on it? Do we just need to see what happens to these animals? Do we just need to see you know, footage, pictures, because I can show you. Do we need to smell the disease-infested hollow halls of the slaughterhouses? Maybe we need to hear the screams of the animals as they head to slaughter, or as we shove them to slaughter. Because if you want to meet me after, I'll take you guys on a tour, but be careful what you ask for. Maybe you say it needs to affect you personally, physically, it needs to affect you. Okay, well, it does. Stress is known to promote tumor growth in many, many types of cancers. Cortisol is the stress hormone our body produces when we are under feelings of stress. Anxiety, loneliness, pain, even exhaustion. The exact same feelings these factory farm animals are experiencing. And so they produce pretty intensely high levels of cortisol. When we eat the meat of these factory farm animals, we are eating their cortisol. In other words, we are ingesting their stress to go along with the stress we already have. Dr. Eric Sternlich, who's a professor of health science right here at Chapman University and who's my mentor, says external stressors promote tumor growth. So we have all this evidence I've just presented, that factory farming ruins the environment, that meat and dairy intake promote cancer, and that the animals go through uh, horrific suffering as we have seen on tape. So then, what's the alternative? Because <laughs> I've got to give you an alternative, right, after showing you all this. <clears throat> well, evidence shows that a plant-based lifestyle is both planet-friendly and can help to prevent cancer. When I went plant-based, I specifically did it, as I told you guys, because of my Olympic-level confession, and I couldn't stand that animals had to go through this just to make it to my plate. But these changes in my body started occurring that I was just amazed by. 
My joint pain started disappearing. My back pain got better. My PMS subsided. Husband was like, two thumbs up on that one. <laughs> my mind got clearer and crisper. And my recovery process, which is the most important aspect to an elite athlete's life, sped up so abruptly that I was now recovering at half the time of teammates who are 10 years my junior. As a plant-based athlete, I stood on the Olympic podium just five months shy of my 40th birthday, the oldest competitor ever in the Olympic Games in my specific discipline. So most athletes, most athletic trainers too, they associate recovery or repair with protein. So, 100 calories of beef has 10 grams of protein. 100 calories of spinach has 12 grams of protein. I know some of you are like, what? Why didn't somebody tell me this before? It's true, look it up. Plants, greens, vegetables, they have protein. They have quite a lot of protein because they're alive and every living thing has protein. And you don't just have to believe me. Other plant-based athletes that have adopted Olympic level compassion that are right at the top of their game, mixed martial arts great Mac Danzig. How about the abdominals, ladies? or gentlemen, <laughs> nine-time Olympic gold medalist Carl Lewis, tennis legend Martina Navratilova, Houston, Texas uh, running back uh, Aaron Foster. Yep, he went plant-based in 2012, and the next season he led the NFL in number of carries and rushing touchdowns. Popeye. <laughs> I'm just saying. He was kind of ahead of his time, I think, though, right? <laughs> All right, quick, quick pop quiz. I'm only going to give you two choices, so it's going to be pretty easy for you. But the question is, how much protein do we need on a daily basis? Because that's important. Like, how much? Because protein's having like a moment right now in the media, in my opinion. Two choices, and here they are. And if I could get a show of hands, that'd be awesome. How many people think that you need two grams of protein per pound of body weight per day to, let's just say, uh, maintain healthy muscle tissue and repair after your workouts? How many people think that that's the right answer? Okay. How many people uh, think it's one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day? Okay, more of you think the second one. Well, I'm going to give you a visual reference because I think that's probably helpful. I weigh 135 pounds around, and I need 65 grams of protein per day. That's a half a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day to repair from my tough workouts. So still, you may be asking, or I hope you're asking, if I care enough to adopt plant-based lifestyle, if I maybe just even care enough to go home and look into it deeper or do some more research or understand it better, how can just I make a difference because I'm just one person? Well, I'd like to encourage you to go meatless for the rest of the day. How about a challenge? I'd like to challenge you to go meatless for the rest of the day. And as you do, just think of this. If one person, just one, goes meatless, you will save the brutally slaughtered lives of 2,000 of these land animals in your lifetime. I'd like to just leave you with the story of the starfish. After a violent storm at the beach, an old man walked up to a little girl who was tossing starfish one by one back into the water. Now, the beach was covered with starfish as far as the eye could see, and all of them were struggling to get back into the water. But the tide was low, and the sun was really hot, and the starfish, it seemed, they were doomed. And the old man said to the little girl, you know, you're never going to make a difference here, because there are far too many. And with that, the little girl bent down, she picked up a starfish, she tossed it back into the ocean, and she said, I made a difference to that one. Just takes one. <laughs>